Well, now our BBC One's afternoon continues with the life and death of the Scharnhorst in War at Sea. This programme was first shown on St Stephen's Day 1971, the 28th anniversary of the sinking of the Scharnhorst. She was Germany's most successful battleship. She sank an aircraft carrier, an armed merchant cruiser, two destroyers and 100,000 tons of merchant shipping. For over four years, she survived the hazards of bomb, shell, torpedo and mine. Her name was Scharnhorst. Just 28 years ago tonight, on St. Stephen's Day, 1943, the German battleship Scharnhorst, or battle cruiser as we used to call her, was sunk in the Arctic by the guns and torpedoes of the British home fleet. The German Navy called her the lucky Scharnhorst, and she had been lucky until then. She was also what sailors call a happy ship, and all those who served in her were intensely proud of her. Now, unlike the German battleships of the First World War, which had to restrict their operations to the area of the North Sea, those in the Second War uh, were able to go much further afield. Their range was greater, and they burnt oil instead of coal, and so could refuel from tankers which had been sent ahead. The area of Scharnhorst's operations stretched uh, from the Baltic right up the coast of Norway to the Arctic, down to Iceland, across the Atlantic, two-thirds of the way to America, down south of the Azores, and then back from the northwest of France through the English Channel to Wilhelmshaven, her home base in Germany. Well, tonight we shall be following Scharnhorst's career in those waters with the help of participants on both sides, British and German, and also original film, much of which was shot by camera crews who were in the Scharnhorst at the time. We shall be using two of these models here to represent some of the British and German ships. This then is Scharnhorst's story, her life and death, and to begin with, her birth. She was launched at Wilhelmshaven in 1936, and named after the famous general of the Napoleonic Wars. She was the first battleship of Germany's new resurgent navy. Bismarck, Tirpitz, and others even vaster were to follow. She was a graceful ship with long slender lines and distinctive flared bow. 32,000 tons, she had a wartime complement of nearly 2,000 officers and men, among them midshipmen, paymasters, meteorological experts, cipher clerks, a camera crew, and a padre. Her 11-inch guns were inferior to those of any British battleship, but her speed of 32 knots made her virtually uncatchable. When the Scharnhorst was put into commission, I was the first navigating officer. On that day, we had dinner in the officer's wardroom, and the captain has given a speech to, his, to the officers and said, gentlemen, remember that the spirit you will put into the crew of a ship will stay as long as the ship is alive. And that was happened. Saunos was a lucky ship. Hitler had told his admirals there would be no war until at least 1944, by which time the German Navy would be in a position to challenge the British. But this promise went the way of most of his others. And when war did break out in September 1939, Scharnhorst and her sister ship Neisenau were still not fully operational. That same month, a new captain was appointed to her, Kurt Caesar Hoffmann, who was to command her brilliantly during the next two and a half years. By November, Scharnhorst and Neisenau were ready for their first sortie and sailed north towards the Atlantic. On November the 23rd, at about four in the afternoon, they were here, between the Faroes and Iceland, when the Scharnhorst sighted a ship. She was the old P&O liner Royal Pindy, which in peacetime had carried thousands of soldiers and civil servants and their wives and families to and from India. Now she was in the Royal Navy, armed with ancient six-inch guns, a part of the Northern Patrol whose main job was to intercept enemy merchant ships trying to get back to Germany. She was commanded by my father, who had been retired from the Navy because of government economies after the First World War, a thing that greatly saddened him, and now, 18 years later, and at the age of 60, he found himself, to his inexpressible joy, recalled to sea. 
A few weeks earlier, he'd written to my mother, wondering if he hadn't got, as he put it, too rusty. And he went on, it's all come back, and I find that there is little I've forgotten. But I feel I must make good, and I realize the responsibility of this command more than any former ones. His crew, many of whom had served the ship in peacetime, were mostly naval pensioners and reservists. Well, Scharnhorst signaled Royal Pinia to stop and fired a warning shot across her bows, both of which she ignored. Then Scharnhorst opened fire with her main guns and immediately Royal Pinia replied with her four starboard guns. It was, of course, a hopelessly unequal match and soon Royal Pindy was on fire fore and aft. She did, however, score one hit on Scharnhorst's forecastle. Abandoned ship was now ordered, and some of the survivors succeeded in lowering three boats. As they dropped astern, they watched the Royal Pindy, still forging ahead, disappear like a blazing bonfire into the dusk. Scharnhorst and Nyser now picked up 27 men, and next day a British ship rescued another 11. Unfortunately, my father was not among them. Well, in Britain, this action somehow caught the country's imagination in a way that it might not have done later. For it was the first naval action of the war, and it showed people that they could still rely on the Navy, and that even in a ship manned by pensioners and reservists, the Navy was going to fight this war's battles as it had those of the past, whatever the outcome, whatever the odds. As the Prime Minister, Mr. Chamberlain, said of the Royal Wapindi's crew, they must have known as soon as they sighted the enemy that there was no chance for them, that they had no thought of surrender. Their example will be an inspiration to those who come after them. Well, the Admiralty now sent every available ship after the German squadron. But the German Admiral cunningly took his ships up here, hung about for two days in the Arctic, then, in tempestuous weather, raced home down the Norwegian coast. Four days after sinking the Royal Pindy, Scharnhorst and Neisenau were safely back at anchor in Wilhelmshaven. <laughs> In April 1940, Germany invaded Norway, and two months later, the British had to evacuate. One of the last ships to leave Norway was the old aircraft carrier Glorious, escorted by the destroyers Acasta and Arden. On the afternoon of June the 8th, Glorious was west of the Lofoten Islands on her way back to Britain. She had on board swordfish aircraft. But unaccountably, and in the event unforgivably, none of them had been ordered on patrol. Perhaps her captain felt that in such a remote sea area, his ship was safe from attack. A midshipman in the foretop suddenly has seen a very short cloud of smoke in a big distance. He reported, Scharnhorst deemed to this cloud, and shortly later was recovered as an aircraft carrier which we attacked, and the first impression was that we must hit as soon as possible on the flight deck. There was a fearful swishing noise that went right over the flight deck. I thought, this is it. And before long, another salvo came in and set the whole hangar ablaze, the aircraft, everything. With glorious sinking, Scharnhorst turned her attention to the two destroyers. Neither stood a chance. Ardent was soon sunk, and then a caster made a last desperate stab. After our chummy ship, the Ardent, had been sunk, it was then our turn. Just before we came out of the smoke screen, we had orders we was going to fight uh, four torpedoes. We came out of the smoke screen, an altered course to stab, and fired the four torpedoes. And all of a sudden, there was a great cheer went up, and I looked over, and I could see a great column of water rise from one of the sides of the ship. Later on, we learned that two petty officers and 46 men have been killed. We got this also a lot of water into the ship, had to break off the operation, and steam on one engine to one time. The captain gave the order of abandon ship, and approximately a hundred men abandoned ship. After about four days in the water, there was only three of us left. 
One of those died half an hour before we was picked up by a trawler and uh, the other chap died in hospital, leaving me the only survivor from 150 men. From Glorious's ship's company of 1,203, only 43 were saved, and from the Ardent, only two, both picked up by a German seaplane. And yet, when one remembers the number of troop ships and tankers that were returning from Norway at this time, many of them very close to the track of Scharnhorst and Neisenau, one realizes how lucky they were not to have been annihilated too. Well, that same summer, the German army overran France, and this gave the German Navy a sudden and unexpected windfall, a number of well-equipped ports on the very edge of the Atlantic battlefield, the place where the real sea war was being fought out. Brest, in particular, had docks that could take both Scharnhorst and Neisenau. On January the 22nd, 1941, the battlecruisers sailed north to the Atlantic under Admiral Gunther Lutyens, later to die in the Bismarck. And on the night of February the 3rd, they passed through the Denmark Straits between Iceland and Greenland, unobserved, and reached the open Atlantic. Next morning, the Admiral signaled to his squadron, for the first time in our history, German surface warships have succeeded in breaking through the British blockade. We shall now go forward to success. And so, in a small way, they did. With supply ships which they met in secret rendezvous, they prowled about the Atlantic for two months. A floating army of nearly 5,000 men, complete with laundry, cinema, tailor shops and van. At first the weather was vile and the only convoy they met had a battleship escort which prevented them from attacking. They sank a few ships sailing alone, then moved to warmer waters south of the Azores. Here the crew was able to relax a little and enjoy the tropical sunshine. Here too they met a U-boat, the U-124, and exchanged information and messages. Later they found another convoy, also protected by a battleship, so again they couldn't attack, and in an odd reversal of roles, guided U-124 and other U-boats onto it. The morale of the crew during the trips of two months in the Atlantic was the whole time excellent. Everybody did his best and the organization has given every crew member enough rest. The only trouble we had a little bit was the meals and the food must be a little better changed, but that was not a morale for the crew members, but that was a little bit um, inflexibility of the paymaster. At a conference in mid-Atlantic, Admiral Lutyens told his captains they were to go north again. And here on March the 15th and 16th in the convoy dispersal area, they had the biggest success of the voyage. A westbound convoy was sighted, which had just been released by its escorts. At long last, the tigers had found the lambs. One by one, the brave ships were sunk. Apple foam, British strength, silver fur, royal crown. Altogether on the cruise, 22 ships were sunk or captured, 31 men killed, over 600 taken prisoner. Some prisoners were put on board captured tankers and sent with German prize crews to France. Others remained in the warships. I think uh, because of my, my age, uh, being only 14 years old, uh, one of the German sailors uh, made friends with me and uh, he treated me quite well. He gave me cigarettes, chocolates, and, and uh, he christened me Moses, which is a, a name which they give to young people aboard the German ship, like a cadet or something like that. The food uh, aboard the German ship was uh, uh, something strange to us. It was sort of out of another world, and, and uh, uh, it took a lot of getting used to. We've got things like fish soup, fruit soup. It wasn't like uh, English food. Other than that, uh, as regards treatment and, and, and life aboard the Sharnos, I, I've got no complaints at all. I can remember one time, the time that the only that we came up onto deck was for the funeral of this donkey greaser. 
and one was amazed to notice that there were two tankers plus the Nisenauer at a standstill while Charlie Hughes, this greaser, was given a full-class military funeral. And this makes one wonder where the Navy was while these ships were at a standstill. On March the 22nd, Scharnhorst and Neisenau entered Brest in the northwest of France, having sunk 116,000 tons of Allied shipping. The Germans' most pressing need now was to repair and service the ships in readiness for another cruise, this time with the Bismarck and Prince Eugen. What the British needed was intelligence about them, and one of the first agents they recruited was a French naval lieutenant stationed in Brest dockyard. All through 1941, I sent reports on German activities, and especially Charnost and Neisnau. I told the Admiralty where the ships were, which were the camouflage, which were the damage, if they were ready or not to sail. Of course, there was a lot of bombing on these ships, but I'm sorry, bombs very often crashed the town and not very often the ships. Night after night, there'd be raids from one squadron or another on Brest, and day after day in the papers, you'd read that the Scharnhorst and Eisenhower had been bombed. And yet the very fact, of course, that there had to be raids night after night meant that they weren't being hit. You had no navigational aids in those days at all, no radar aids. You didn't even have pathfinders. You had to do all the work by pencil and paper. Uh, I remember looking down and seeing blackness. Nothing but blackness. Some, some blackness slightly different from the other because it was the sea. But uh, any hope of seeing the docks, even breast, seemed remote. We flew over it for a bit, dropped our bombs. I hope it hit, well, I remember hoping at the time it hit the land somewhere. When we came back, I remember the pilot of the aircraft wrote down as a result of the operation, doubtful. I remember thinking that was extremely optimistic at the time. In fact, both ships were damaged by bombs despite elaborate camouflage. So was the cruiser Prince Eugen when she joined them after the sinking of the Bismarck. Soon it became a matter of urgency to get all three ships back to Germany intact. Admiral Siliax worked out a daring plan for the ships to leave Brest by night and go through the Straits of Dover by day. At Wolfslair in East Prussia, he and Commodore Ruger, commanding seaward defences west, put the plan to Hitler. Uh, we were at once uh, let into Hitler's uh, operations room. He uh, arrived there very soon with officers of the Air Force and his own staff. Uh, everybody gave his uh, opinion on his part of the operation. Then Hitler summed up, said in case of a man with cancer, we don't do anything, he will die, so we'll operate and go through the channel as suggested. The funny thing was that uh, his summing up was very good, but uh, he took whole sentences uh, exactly as we had said them, uh, which struck me as peculiar. Admiral Ziliad asked me to come to his cabin and told me there, under this most secrecy, that he has got the order to bring the ships back from, Germ from Brest to Germany by the channel. I sent for the quartermaster and asked him to bring me the pilot books, sea charts and so on, from Brest to the Atlantic, to South to Africa, and also through the, through the channel, so that he didn't know what was planned and he was confused. In the Admiralty, we had two very strong indications that the movement was about to take place. First of all, there was a big increase in the mine sweeping effort they were putting in, and secondly, and more important, destroyers were moving down channel to Brest. Obviously, they were going to uh, escort something big, and the only big things there were Scharnhorst and Neisner. So it seemed to us quite certain that they were coming out. I sent several messages and reports to London, saying that the ships would sail by night, that the sailing would be probably in the new moon because of the darkness. We had Philippon's report, which did give his appreciation that it would sail by night. But of course, we had a great many other sources of information, and we had to make up our own mind. And our own opinion was that they wouldn't take the risk of going through the channel by day, which would have happened had they sailed from Brest at night. Well, this was the route for the German ships so carefully prepared by Admiral Siliax and Commodore Ruger.
northeast from Brest, across to Cherbourg by night, then across the Bay of the Seine in the forenoon, and then hugging the French coast, a midday dash through the Straits of Dover, and so back home. Well, to the British, such a plan seemed too crazy to consider. But to Admiral Ciliax, who had been promised massive sea and air support, there seemed a better chance in fighting off an enemy he could see, rather than one that came at him out of the dark. The night of the breakout was finally chosen, and to preserve complete secrecy, the Germans went in for the most elaborate deceptions. White uniforms and tropical helmets were sent to the ships. Barrel of oil, marked for use in the tropics only, were moved ostentatiously about Brest dockyard. The garrison commander in Paris sent some officers invitations to a shooting party at Rambouillet for the day after the breakout, and in Brest itself, preparations went ahead for a fancy dress party. For Admiral Ciliax now, there was nothing more to be done except hope for the best. On the night of February the 11th, 1942, Scharnhorst, Neisenau and Prince Eugen crept silently to sea. So well had the secret been kept that only Admiral Ciliax and a handful of officers knew where they were bound. In a very short time, the visibility was excellent, so I could see that the destroyers came along and take over their stations. The Eisenhower was following and Prince Eugen too. So the whole unit was together and the Admiral gave the order to go ahead, so we went to up to 17 knots. And then the watch officer asked me, what will be the next course? I answered, northeast. Northeast? Yes. Tomorrow night evening he will be at Wilhelmshaven at home. Daybreak came on. The German plane circled around the task force. No British. And then in the, we went further and further, and everybody was expecting and looked around where are the British, but we couldn't see anything. No plane. Well, where were the British indeed? That the German ships hadn't been spotted by now was due to an incredible series of accidents, which, if we'd ever really thought they might leave Brest by night, would probably have never happened. The submarine Sea Lion, on patrol off the approaches to Brest, had with withdrawn to recharge her batteries and uh, was down here about an hour before the ship sailed. The aircraft, which made a nightly reconnaissance of the waters between Brest and Ushant round here, had had to return because its radar had packed up, and between its departure and the arrival of a relief aircraft, the ships had passed. The reconnaissance aircraft of the next sector between Ushant and the Ile de Breha, which is there, also had its radar pack up and returned home, but unaccountably no relief was sent. The aircraft of the third sector between Le Havre and Boulogne there functioned quite normally, but as its patrol finished at dawn, this aircraft had turned for home before the German squadron had arrived. And the German squadron by this time was up here. Well, soon after 10 o'clock, fighter command at Biggin Hill were picking up on their radar screen some unusual air activity in the direction of Dieppe, and they sent off a Spitfire to investigate. I sighted uh, one or two destroyers. I thought initially that the, the Navy was off course, but uh, I was convinced otherwise shortly after the heavy anti-aircraft fire, and uh, the fact that these ships were speeding through the water quite fast. Normally we kept radio silence. But on this occasion, I felt that uh, this was important enough to in inform in the clear on the radio, and I so broadcast to Biggin Hill what was happening. I then hurried back to base to tell the 11 Group fighter controller what I'd seen. He didn't seem too convinced about it and wanted me to send out another reconnaissance. I was rather annoyed about that. During the morning, uh, uh, three, four, or possibly five people uh, who were nearer to the uh, detailed information than I was, nearer to the aircraft or to the radar, came through and spoke to me. And I now realized, being wise after the event, that of course they were trying to uh, explain to me um, in, in suitable security words that um, it was the Neisner and the Scarnholz. But unfortunately, uh, the, the message just never clicked off anything in my brain because I wasn't thinking of the Neisner and Scarnhorse and had no reason to do so. 
And so, inexorably and seemingly invisibly, the German armada sailed on. By 11, they were past the 2K. By 11.30, they were a beam of Boulogne. And so far, not a thing had happened to impede their progress or cause Admiral Ciliac and his men to think that anything would. The morning went on. We came nearer and nearer to Dover. Then I stepped into the chart house. And then came the chief of staff, alongside and asked me, uh, up to now, it seems to be only a navigational training trip for you and your crew. When we passed Dover, exactly at noon, we have seen outside on the port side the splashes of some British guns, but very far away from the course of the ship. Uh, unfortunately, of course, we couldn't see them because I uh, thick fog the whole time that they were in rain. If uh, we'd been able to see them, uh, it's uh, pretty certain that we should have got hits on them. In fact, I should have got into a lot of trouble if we hadn't. Now it was the turn of the motor torpedo boats at Dover, which had just returned to harbor from a morning exercise. The chief of staff rang up to say the battle cruiser were off Boulogne. How soon could we go? Well, we were, of course, warmed up and ready, so we went immediately. Because I wouldn't normally have seen anything being down below on the radio, but the radio packed up. I shouted up the voice pipe. Couldn't get any sense up there. It was just all shouting and hollering and panic stations. And so I went up top. Wow. And I thought the old German Navy was after me. Just me alone, you know, battleships, destroyers, minesweepers, e boats 20, 30 yards away, sky black with Messerschmitts. I told the skipper that the radio had packed up, so he said, uh, grab a gun. Anyway, I got hold of a rifle, pointed it at a Scharnhorst, just to try and look brave. No, it really it wasn't a, a reasonable operation, from my point of view. Merit torpedo boats are, are strictly night animals, and to try and attack through a screen of e-boats in daylight, e-boats being both faster and much more heavily armed, it wasn't really an act of war. We did, I think, the only thing to do, which was to close the boats to about 400 yards and fire our torpedoes under them. Battle cruisers simply turned towards to avoid the torpedoes, and, and that was that. Next came a suicide mission from Manston, six ancient swordfish led by Eugene Esmond, whose squadron the year before had put a torpedo into the Bismarck. Like the MTBs, they'd been expecting to make a night attack. They'd also been promised an escort of fighters, most of which never turned up. We circled Manston for a few minutes, waiting for our fighter escort to turn up. As soon as the first squadron arrived, Esmond decided it was time to go. And we went down towards the sea, leveling off at 50 feet. We recognized them as very old swordfish. The torpedo planes, they came nearer and nearer and a very low high and were attacked by the Ebolts and the German fighters. One after the other was shot down and then everybody on the bridge thought, oh, these poor guys just switched sides. Of the 18 men who had set out from Manston minutes before, only five survived. They were all decorated for bravery. Lieutenant Commander Esmond was given a posthumous Victoria Cross. In the early afternoon, we have passed the Dover Strait, and from then on, we were very happy that the worst part of the mission had been safely completed. Then we had only to go through the sands to the Dutch coast, but suddenly the ship was lifted due to an explosion under the forepast of the uh, part of the ship by a mine, ground mine. From this moment on, we didn't have any electricity, no steam, nothing. The ship was completely dead. And that was a very critical phase. If some British bombers have attacked during that time, but there were no British. So we were very glad that we could steam away in about 30 minutes by F-27 knots with three engines. 
When I estimated that the ships had passed my area, I ordered a bottle of champagne for the operations room. Uh, soon after, we got a message that Charles had hit a mine. That gave us quite a shock. But uh, I uh, took the message and uh, looked at it very closely and found that uh, the mine detonation had happened uh, two miles inside the area of a uh, neighboring uh, Edward, and so I ordered another bottle of champagne. But there was no champagne for the British. The Nizana and Prince Eugen were now off the coast of Holland, up here, somewhere ahead of Scharnhorst, and here they were attacked by a group of destroyers which came out from Harwich. None of the torpedoes from the destroyers hit, and one of them, the Worcester, was very seriously damaged. For the rest of the afternoon, both ships uh, and Scharnhorst, now some 30 miles astern, were attacked by groups of bombers which came out from bases in eastern England. 242 altogether were sent out. Only about 39 found the target, and of these, 15 were shot down. They scored no hits, and it seemed now that there was nothing more that we could do. However, other bombers had previously laid mines ahead of the tracks of the two ships. And at 8 o'clock off Terschelling here, Nisenau hit one of these mines, while an hour and a half later, Scharnhorst hit another. Despite considerable damage to both ships, they safely reached harbour in the early hours of the next morning. At noon the next day, we entered the lock at Wilhelmshaven, and we were naturally glad that we have completed this mission. And suddenly, I have seen on the keys of the lock a lot of people. And I told to the captain, Captain, I think there is now a big reception committee. I think we have done an excellent job. Of course, it was a failure. Um, I think probably the main reason was because we had planned very confidently on the fact that they would go through the channel by night. And of course, coming through the channel by day put all our plans out. So ended an operation which Admiral Ciliac said had succeeded beyond all expectations. The London Times agreed. Nothing more mortifying to the pride of British sea power, it said, has happened in home waters since the 17th century. And yet what had been tactically a German triumph was also strategically a German failure. For by leaving Brest, the German surface navy had abandoned its Atlantic base. For Captain Hoffman too, the conclusion of the operation marked an end and a beginning. And Gross Admiral Raider came and keel on board to present me with the Ritterkreuz. He told me that I would be promoted to Admiral and would have to leave the ship. I asked him if I could refuse the promotion and remain on the ship. But of course, that was not allowed. During the next two weeks, there were heavy air raids on both ships in a final effort to destroy them. But on February the 26th, Nisenau was so badly damaged that she took no further part in the war. The lucky Scharnhorst escaped again, though her repairs were not completed before the summer, and she wasn't fully operational before the end of the year. Well, Hitler was now obsessed by an idea that the British had plans to invade Norway, and he gave orders for what remained of the German surface fleet to be concentrated there for its defense. Accordingly, in March 1943, Scharnhorst sailed to join Tirpitz and other ships in the fjords of northern Norway. This bleak anchorage was to be the Scharnhorst's home for the next nine months, the last nine months of her life. Her crew longed to take her to sea, but the timid policy of the German Admiralty and an increasing shortage of oil fuel condemned her to a life of immobility. It was the sort of life, like that of the British sailors at Scapa Flow, where one had to make one's own amusements. We were four hours on, four hours off. We had, we had to make our own games, playing chess, cards. We had boxing down below. On our time off, we went ashore, had snow fights. We had the men dressed up like women in a cabre, and we'd seen the cinema. We had fish in the morning, fish at lunch, fish at night. For sewers, I had fish poison in the end. Uh, we were always ready, because the morale was very high, to have a go, to go out at sea. And then at the end of 1943, the chance came. With the approach of the Arctic winter and its almost perpetual night, the British had restarted their convoys to Russia. 
There were demands on the German Admiralty to help relieve the pressure on the Eastern Front, and Scharnhorst was ordered to attack the next eastbound convoy. Rear Admiral Bai, a former Commodore of Destroyers, veteran of Narvik and the Channel Dash, was appointed to direct the operation. Under him was Scharnhorst's new captain, Fritz Hintzer, who had joined the ship two months before. Christmas Day dinner on the mess decks was barely over when the sailing orders came. With an escort of destroyers, Scharnhorst made her way down the long fjord to the open sea. Late that night, Admiral Bai foolishly broke radio silence to signal to his base, and this was immediately picked up by the British Admiralty. Within minutes, the news had been passed to the battleship Duke of York, which, under Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser, and quite unknown to the Scharnhorst, was approaching the convoy from the west. I think four o'clock in the morning on Boxing Day, I was woken up by a signal from the Admiralty saying, uh, the Admiralty believe the Sean Horse is at sea. And that's the only communication I had with the Admiralty during the whole of the time I was up there. Well, all that night, Sean Horst and her destroyers steamed northeast towards the convoy. It was blowing a gale from the southwest, and the destroyers were rolling heavily in a following sea. At 8.20, Sean Horst was here, steaming north, but without the destroyers, who'd gone off to the south and never regained contact with her. Now, two things Admiral Bai didn't realize. First, that the convoy he was looking for was some 30 miles to the west of him, and secondly, that a covering force of three cruisers was fast approaching from the east. At 8.40, the cruisers picked up Scharnhorst on their radar at 17 miles, and when the range was down to six miles, they fired star shell and opened fire. Well, Scharnhorst was completely taken by surprise, put her wheel hard over, and sped away as fast as she could to the east. One shell had hit her. And though it didn't kill anybody, its effect on the outcome of that day was to be decisive, for it had completely destroyed her forward radar set. From now on, Scharnhorst was blind. The cruisers didn't attempt to follow her because their speed was at least five knots less than Scharnhorst, and in any case, their main duty was to fall back on the convoy in case the enemy attacked again. And that's just what she did do. Soon after noon, Scharnhorst was sighted with the cruisers again, and there was another brief engagement. Norfolk was hard hit, Sheffield was hit too, but less so, and if Admiral Bay, Bay had pressed home his attack, things might have gone badly for us. But this was the second time he'd been surprised without warning, and not wishing to risk his ship further, he broke off the engagement and turned for home. Now, the coast of Norway was only about 100 miles away, as you can see, and with the Scharnholz going at 28 knots, her crew, or those of them who weren't being acutely seasick, many of them hadn't been to sea before, reckoned that they would be back snugly at anchor in the fjord within a matter of hours. They knew that the cruisers were following them, but it never occurred to anyone, not even Admiral Bai, that any danger lay ahead. Because the forward radar was out of action, they didn't know that the Duke of York here with the cruiser Jamaica and the four destroyers had now cut them off from their base and that Admiral Fraser's plans were about to come to fruition. For the third and last time that day, Scharnhorst was in for a shock. On the bridge of the Duke of York, from the reports from the Sheffield and the Belfast, we could judge almost exactly when we were going to make contact with the Scharnhorst. And we knew we had about an hour of awkward waiting before action was joined. And this was really the time when um, the Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Fraser, was simply dominating the whole ship. Um, he wore no naval uniform as such. He just wore uh, old trousers and a polo neck shirt, a uh, polo neck sweater and a rather battered admiral's hat. And with his pipe um, belching sparks and flame, uh, he moved among us all, um, being extremely confident and quiet and delightful. And I particularly remember we had two young midshipmen, only about uh, teenagers, who had both been to sea for a very few weeks and were very frightened, as we all were. And um, it was wonderful the way Admiral Fraser, realizing how these two lads were pretty nervous, uh, found time and the humanity to give them all little um, nameless, useless tasks to do to keep them busy. And at the same time, realizing we knew how he felt, um, winking slightly to us to realize that we also were nervous. It was a real triumph of a, a single personality dominating a, a ship's company. When we decided exactly the time the battle would start, because we were following the ship right down, it came out to about... Uh, 5.30, I think, and uh, 
So we discussed whether we should have tea before the battle or wait till afterwards. We had tea before the battle. Uh, there had been a, a broadcast on the um, public address system to the ship's company, which told them exactly what the tactics were going to be. And uh, the idea was to close to within um, 12,000 yards, six miles, of the Scharnhorst before firing star shell, uh, in the hope that the first broadside would take her by surprise and um, prove lethal. So we watched her on the plot um, coming down from the northward on a closing course until a moment came and the signal went out at 12,000 yards, illuminate the target with star shell. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on the bridge a few seconds after this, and the star shell burst uh, right over the target, and it was the most incredible sight. Um, the Shan horse looking like a marvelous fish, like a huge salmon coming almost dead towards us. And as she became aware of the star shell bursting above her and sensing something to the southward, she swung her wheel right over to port, and we had this wonderful sight of this very graceful, beautiful ship, with all her guns turning round now towards the starboard to engage this unknown unit, uh, this menace to the south of her. And then, um, as our first broadside thundered out, uh, we watched our first broadside uh, fall right across the stern. A star shot came right across us. We were lit up from stern on this, and... Uh, they landed on the deck, and I was in the tower then, when I was certain the armament had a hit, and the, the armor plate was absolutely red, and something whizzling around in the middle of it, like it's coming through, and I grabbed to my, you know, I thought, oh, here it comes, but it didn't come through, it went outside, and, and there was hay all over. One shell hit Sean Horse boiler room. And though the damage was patched up, its effects were felt later. Meanwhile, she took advantage of her superior speed. By now we could see in the plot that the Scharnhorst was drawing away from us so fast that um, very soon she was going to be out of uh, radar range. We couldn't see her by now. We were firing entirely by radar. And eventually a moment came when the Admiral ordered uh, to cease fire. And immediately uh, you could feel in the bridge, the effect of this uh, order. We felt um, we've had our chance. It'll never come again. She'll slip away now towards the northeast in the darkness and the um, winter conditions. And the only hope at this time was the destroyers. I realized at once in the destroyers that we were going to be faced with a chase. We only had a little speed in excess of the Scharnhorst, and to catch up was going to be quite a business. After a time, I had a shout from the officer in the plot who said he was sure we were getting much nearer the Scharnhorst, followed almost immediately by another shout, and he said he thought she had altered course. I could now see the Scharnhorst in my glasses and realized that this in fact had happened, that she had turned round and was steering between the two groups of destroyers, so giving us the most perfect target. The destroyers hit her with at least three torpedoes, and from this moment, her end was set. The destroyers were sent in, or they came towards us with torpedoes. But uh, we fought them off. We took another course again, again thinking to go to the Norwegian coast, but then the artillery started up again. And uh, by that time, the cruisers were there as well. So we had them from both sides. They were behind us, in front of us, on the side of us. And uh, they came all from all sides. When we got up to her, I think within about um, half a mile, a mile, she was half over on her side, no, a quarter over, I might say. And she was fires about, fires all over the place. And uh, it was really, very really unpleasant having to go on shooting at her because we didn't know <coughs> whether she'd surrendered or what, or what she'd done. But uh, we had to think her, unpleasant as it was. 
by quarter to eight, we were alight from stern right over the ship. Uh, and uh, we had these last torpedo hits on starboard side, and it came abundant ship. With that, I went up to the tower, into the crow's nest to get out. And uh, by the time I got out there, the ship already was starboard side lying, so we had to have a hand shaking us to pull us out. And there was the uh, artillery uh, captain up top, and he pushed his hands out to us, and we made a chain to pull each other out. And as I get out, I see the blokes jumping right from the searchlight tower right down onto the ship. By the time they hit the water, they were already instantly killed because they hit the iron right beneath the water. I went over to the starboard side, and by the time I got over to the starboard side, she just went flop right over, and I was slung right out into the water, away from the ship. And the first thing I thought about was raft. I've got no life jacket. Uh, well, I haven't had time to get one. And uh, I saw all bits floating around. And the next thing I, I saw, uh, there was a piece of wood, and I just grabbed for it, and it was one of the gunnery rafts from the from the bonbons. Yeah, well, after seeing her on fire and exploding everywhere, a lot of us uh, that was stood around, more or less, just watching her go down, seeing these chaps jump over, forward, thinking, well, they were there, lot, and thought to ourselves, well, it could have been us instead of them. It's not a nice uh, death uh, to go through, you know. But I thought, well, it was either them or us. By the time I was lying pretty on the raft, I had somebody got hold of my boot, which I let go. Because uh, if you don't let the boot go, you go with them. And uh, because you couldn't save anybody, because the moment you're in the water, all you think about is yourselves. And then, as we watched the scan, you could see the echo that had been the Scharnhorst gradually getting smaller and smaller, a little golden streak. And as you watched it going smaller, it eventually just disappeared. And we knew that the Scharnhorst had sunk. I saw all the blokes screaming and shouting, uh, Scharnhorst, hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray. And then all was certain the song was coming up. On uh, on the on the grave, Siemens grave, there's nothing but no roses. Uh, by that time, I looked round. I saw the ship turn right round, and I saw the propellers still turning because by that time the English had shot a star shot right across us. Then all of a sudden, I saw her going down, come back up again. Then all of a sudden, finally she went down. As she went down, I heard this tremendous trommel in my stomach, in my legs, you know. There was a big explosion below. And uh, by that time, all I thought about was to get away, get, you know, get saved. You know, when I look around, I see these blokes, they're swimming between all these bits and still shouting, high our Führer, you know, and Scharnhorst, hip hip hooray, again and again. And I thought, well, what a waste. From Scharnhorst's crew of 1,968, only 36 survived. It was the last duel between battleships fought by the Royal Navy.
Ludovic Kennedy will be back again at the end of this evening on BBC One with his series on Macmillan at War, as now Lord Stockton talks about his involvement in the negotiations which led to the Italian armistice following Mussolini's downfall. Macmillan at War is at 11.15 tonight. BBC Two, in a few minutes, once again goes backstairs at the White House with the dramatised series on the private lives of various US presidents. Here on BBC One, it's a cartoon time now with our good friends Tom and Jerry. 